launched on the banks of the River Seine here in Paris. It's an apt metaphor for an organisation which acts as a bridge between East and West. The Arab World Institute celebrating 30 years as a unique space for exhibitions, performances and debates. And with almost a million visitors last year, it's certainly a successful ambassador for the Arabic-speaking countries it represents. Franchement top, super. Alors Lima, euh, moi je suis une grande fan. C'est un lieu de culture cosmopolite. C'est une fenêtre entre la France et le Moyen-Orient. La cohésion et l'unité entre les pays arabes. Pour moi, c'est... Euh... <rire> c'est une culture que personnellement, je connais pas tant que ça. Hein Un endroit qui est en dehors de tous les clichés. Diversité et unité, oui. From the outset, the building's aesthetic has been an important part of its identity, especially the Moucharabiers, that is, architect Jean Nouvel's modern take on the traditional latticework windows, which regulate the temperature inside and offer a little privacy too. All 240 of them have recently been repaired. Claire Rush takes a peek. A grand display of Arabic architecture frozen for years by a mechanical failure. But now, the renowned Mashrabiyas are playing with light once again. A malfunction which had become symbolic of the museum's state of disrepair and made their renovation all the more vital. One of the problems we had was deciding which new construction materials to use, as these have changed a lot over the last 30 years. However, we have learned how to better grease and lubricate the different parts. That has been one of the most important aspects of this renovation. The library also received a makeover, thanks to donations from Arab countries such as Qatar, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. But it's the French state that finances the daily operations of the site, whose mission is as cultural as it is diplomatic. The museum was commissioned by former French president Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, but it was built during the presidency of his successor, François Mitterrand, who commissioned other major projects at the time, such as the Louvre pyramids. The museum's architect, Jean Nouvel, wanted the institution to be the Arab world's new cultural ambassador, but it fell into disrepair. For its 30th anniversary, the museum wants to reinvent itself. Initially, the museum was intended to be a space of cultural exchange between the Arab world and other civilizations. We still have the same mission. The world has changed, but we shouldn't let the extraordinary richness of Arab culture be overshadowed by the violence and extremism in certain parts of the Arab world. Arab youth are also inventing, creating and looking towards the future. Invente, crée et va de l'avant. Concerts, conferences, projections, Arabic language classes, and acclaimed exhibitions such as the one focused on Christians in the Arab world. The museum wants to attract more visitors, and the opening of a new local branch in the city of Tourcoing in northern France should give that mission a boost and spread its reach. In 1987, when the Institute was being inaugurated, my next guest was being awarded France's top literary prize, the Prix Goncourt, for his book, The Sacred Night. Taha Ben Jaloun has made a name for himself as an artist between two cultures, Morocco and France. And his is a powerful voice in debates on issues that affect Arabic countries and France. A writer, poet and painter, Benjaloon's exhibiting his own work at the Institute for this special anniversary. Taha Benjaloon, thanks so much for joining us. As an artist, a writer, a citizen of France and Morocco, what does this institution, this building, mean to you? It's really important for there to be a place in France, in Paris, where all the different cultures of the Arab world can meet. These are diverse, yet similar cultures, and they've gained more visibility and exposure here than in the Arab world. And the Arab World Institute here in Paris plays a cultural and a diplomatic role. How do you think it fulfills these two missions? The diplomatic aspect is less interesting for me. If we had to wait for Arab countries to get more involved in what's happening here, 
plus efficace à ce qui se passe ici, on attendra longtemps. Well, we'll be waiting for a while. There are countries that contribute and others that don't want to pay. But overall, France plays a big role. It's putting in the work and it's really a good thing for Arab culture, for the Arab world. A recent book of yours, Un Pays sur les Nerfs, which could be translated as A Country on the Brink, discusses the Quran and its perhaps misinterpretations by extremists. Do you think that arts and culture can really influence these religious and social questions? Of course, culture is the only weapon we have. It's what allows us to put things into perspective to get the truth. There's a constant hijacking of the Quran, of Islamic scriptures, a political hijacking to justify awful things like murder and violence, things that Islam condemns. So it's the role of intellectuals to answer and to speak out and to rectify these horrible interpretations of Muslim culture and religion. You've written extensively in your career about Islam and its interpretations. What for you is the most important thing to add to the debate? You know, when I write, I never know if the message will go through. What matters is to write, to visit schools and talk to the children. What they do with the message is something I can't control, but it needs to be done. We can't be quiet and sit back and say there's nothing we can do. And you've written about the uprisings known as the Arab Spring, both in non-fiction form and in fictionalized accounts. We're almost seven years on now. How do you see the evolution of that movement? I think that what we called the Arab Spring has been a disaster, and it's still ongoing in Syria and Iraq. We're currently in a deadlock because of the foreign policy of Russia and Iran, who support Bashar al-Assad's regime while he's murdering people. Here at the Arab World Institute, you've been given carte blanche or free reign to exhibit your own paintings. Can you tell us a bit about the inspiration behind these canvases? It's almost the opposite of my written work. I write on solitude, migration, racism, sad things. But I know the world isn't only sorrow. It's also light and joy, and I try to reach that through my paintings that are blissful and happy. If I can make people feel good with my paintings, with my colors, then I'll be happy myself. And when did you start drawing and painting in your life? I started drawing before I knew how to write. I've always been drawing. I could have gone into comic books. I told stories with my drawings because I didn't have the words. And as a painter and a writer, how do you reconcile these two practices? Are they equivalent forms of expression for you? I'm switching a bit from one to the other. In February, I'm publishing a book called The Punishment. It's a dramatic tale of my time in a disciplinary camp when I was 20 years old in the army. It's quite a sad story, but at the same time, there's this beautiful exhibition. Just being able to showcase my work is beautiful. And I want to thank Jack Lung and the Arab World Institute for having me. Thank you so much. Merci à vous. From timeless, vibrant canvases to images that offer a more contemporary vision of Arab societies, the Institute's also hosting its second photography biennale. More than 50 photographers are showing work in eight different venues spread across the French capital. Our reporters went to check it out. Across the Arab world, revolutions big and small are transforming the art of representation. Political and cultural life are evolving at a rapid pace, and local artists are capturing it all. The real face of these countries is something new for the West. These aren't the sorts of works many expect to see when they think of Arab countries. 
I was very happy, happy and surprised to discover a new side of cities like Cairo and Jeddah. In one series of diptychs, we see pairs of faces staring us down. It's always the same person, taken a few years apart. Seeing her own daughters grow up, Rania Matar knew she wanted to distill a sense of transformation, a space between childhood and adulthood that transcends culture and religion. I take photos of girls in the U.S., in Lebanon, in refugee camps. There's a sort of continuity. There's no way of knowing if the photo is taken in the West or in the Middle East, and that's very important. Scenes interrogating the impact of globalization on the individual are a common thread through this Biennale. So too is the idea of an evolving definition of masculinity. What can be seen in public is often a world away from the private reality. Starting with a simple question, namely who are men, you start to realize that we're working with the concept of gender, ideas and a meaning of masculinity. In this case, it's more about how women look at men which is another very interesting dynamic. It's really about asking questions about the nature of freedom. It's an observation that applies to the exhibition as a whole, as it asks what forms freedom can take when cliché and preconception are left at the door. collection that includes artifacts and documents dating back to pre-Islamic times. This centers a precious archive of the region's history and that's exemplified in shows like the recent one focusing on Christian civilizations in the Middle East. And with a clear capacity for renewal and continued investment in education and contemporary arts projects, the Arab World Institute should be celebrating many more decades at the crossroads of culture here in Paris. En arabe, je dis quand on y va. Taïdaïa, Ima. Euh, à qui, hein Ça n'a pas l'air de Qu'est-ce qu'on dit Je vais d'anniversaire, Ima. Aïd Milad Sarid, Lima. Ok. Aïd Milad Sarid. Obrigado. People and Profit, presented by Stephen Carroll. Business news is not about numbers, nor percentages and statistics. Business news is about people and how we live our lives. People and Profit goes beyond numbers to analyze how the global flow of money and profits shape our world. Intelligent and accessible, the show cuts across business, economics and politics. People and Profit on France 24 and France24.com.